right, everybody. Wow. <laughs> Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to the Viva Connections, the SharePoint Framely bi weekly sync call. I, that was, I just came in on the top there. That was pretty exciting. Wow. So uh, let's take a look. So uh, we got all sorts of exciting things. First up, we're going to talk it all about our uh, project updates. We're going to go through everything we've got. We've got lots of samples and tooling and everything for you. We're going to update on the SharePoint framework. Then we will take a picture of our beautiful faces. And then we've got actual demos. Wow. So Luis is up first. She's going to be doing one of my favorite topics, uh, lists and SVGs. Love it. All right, and then Ejaz is up. He's going to do some automated employee onboarding with SharePoint Framework and Microsoft Graph. Uh, I also have been onboarded as an employee, so great job. And then Martin is going to extend Microsoft 365 with custom retention controls, and that sounds very exciting. So let's get going. All right, so here we go. First up, let's talk about what we have available to you. So we have uh, about a billion resources available, and uh, we have one link for all of them. That's that aka.ms slash community, slash home. And if you go there, you'll find all of these links and all of these things. So we've got a bunch of videos all over YouTube for you. We've got a LinkedIn group that's very active where you can share things that you've been working on and also ask for help for others. And then we've got a ton of open source repositories uh, with samples um, and also tooling and all sorts of controls and everything else for you, depending on what you're doing, right? So all across from Power Platform all the way to SharePoint Framework and Graph and everywhere in between and Copilot and so on. Uh, and check all of that out. And let's go on to the next one here. Let's see. All right. So then the calls, you're on one right now. Good job. You did it. All right. Unless you're on YouTube, but then you missed it. But that's fine. We do record all of them, and then you can come to the next one. So please check out this link. You can add a calendar invite that will always be updated for you, even across time zones. It's insane, the technologies today. So we've got one to two of these coming up for you. And, in fact, we've got the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform call coming up here. We got a Microsoft Ignite 2024 watch party. Uh, let's see, David, you want to tell me what that's all about? What are you watching? Yeah, absolutely. So it overlaps <laughs> as part of the call, and you know, surprise, surprise. I know it's kind of not very obvious, but we're gonna watch Ignite. So you'll watch it on your own machines. We'll have the chat open for everybody to typey, clickety, clackety, and use those keyboards, right? Type away in chat, but. Uh, all you got to do is show up. And then the second half, we'll kind of discuss what was announced and all that jazz. So it'll be fun. We're going to collaborate. Show up. We'll be there. Vest and I will be there. A lot of the team members will be there. Can't wait to see you there. Ooh, so you can do all that back channel snarking. It'll be awesome. Uh, good. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, talking about exciting things. Okay. All right. If you would like to present on this call, so if you'd like to be like one of our uh, three amazing presenters today. If you've got an idea, you've got something you've put together, whether that's, you know, all the way to the getting started level or you've got something, you know, life changing and everything, you're somewhere in between, we would love to have you on here. Please fill out uh, this form and we will get in touch with you, get you scheduled. We're happy to work with you, um, you know, get you prepped up. Uh, we can help you with slides. We can help you with the presentation of the demo, whatever you want. Uh, we just want to see you uh, involved and out here, and you'll find that a lot of other people will really appreciate it, too. They get tired of hearing from the same old people like us all the time, right? So, all right, let's go on here. David, what do you got here for uh, for this thing here? Yes, this thing. This thing called sharing is caring. <laughs> Absolutely. It is a program, friends, that provides you hands-on guidance in the community. So if you would like to take advantage of all the amazing samples that you're going to see talked about, you want to contribute, you want to use them, but you're not quite sure how to navigate some of that landscape, it can be a jungle out there. So we're going to give you all the tools you need to chop down those trees and make things happen. These are live sessions, hands-on uh, they are safe space, which means you do not need to be worried that things are going to be recorded. If you ask a question that you think you should already know the answer to, guess what? We all start from somewhere, but it can be intimidating. So we don't record it. Feel free to do uh, all the questioning that you would like. It can be wowee questions. It can be snarky questions, as Chris said. It can be any of that. So absolutely free. We have a session coming up on November 25th, just a little over a week away. Come join us. It'll be great, great fun. And once you do contribute to the community, you can be recognized. Yes, that recognition program, the one that you're looking at on the screen right now. It is alive and well, powered by Credly, and we've got all kinds of new fun badges that have been released and or coming soon. So things like the Refresh Rangers, SBFX Toolkit, Slice of Sample, Season of Getting, and the newest Snippet Sorcerer. <laughs> yeah, that was an official, non-real 
That was an organic <laughs> sound effect, by the way. We want to recognize you, so we are working on all the amazing ways in which we can do that. Uh, we do need you to opt in, though. AK.ms slash community slash recognition. Absolutely free. So get opted in. Give us your information, and we'll make sure you're recognized. Chris, back to you. Wowee. Well, uh, that's over to you, Vessa. What do you got? Well, we uh, we've been running this form uh, for a while. Uh, I'll be pretty fast on this section because we do have three demos. But uh, if you're building anything on Gollop uh, as an extension uh, for SPFX, we're not changing anything yet. Uh, right now, we're looking into collecting input on what kind of things you are actually uh, automating around SPFX dev tooling, uh, so that we can actually think about the future direction in here uh, and what do we want to do. So please, 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 if you do any Gollop task or customization on deployment, please, please fill in the form. AKMS SPFX DevTools feedback. Let's go to the following slide. No changes in here. Last uh, uh, general availability, available version is 26 from September, version 120. And no ET at this point, 121, uh, most likely first quarter of the next fiscal year. Uh, we are heading pretty soon, actually, to the Thanksgiving uh, period and holiday season. Uh, so that always creeps in and <gasps> it's holiday. So um, and we're not going to ship new version in December. So. That's basically why we have 120 is happening there. A uh, few things about the future. Uh, recently shipped Inworks uh, future. Uh, the future is subject to change, but there's a lot of lot of things what we're looking into doing uh, on with the SPFX in the future across the whole Microsoft 365 stack. So uh, looking forward on getting a lot of lot of new capabilities out within the next uh, three to six to twelve months, eighteen months even. Uh, some of the stuff. But anyway, thank you for that quick update. Uh, that was the update from Microsoft side. Fancy. All right. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about some other things. So let's talk about Wee. this uh, blog here. So, uh, Adam, I think uh, you were going to talk about this guy. Am I wrong? Uh, okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, so, hey, we have a PMP blog. Maybe you heard about it already. It's been for, for a while. And now we're going to celebrate new blog posts every two weeks. So from the uh, past two weeks, we had three new blog posts from Louis Fries, who is here with us on the call, Ahmed Jad Alhar, and Ramakari Shana Barma. Sorry, I probably totally missed felt it, but I wasn't ready. So while we be sure to give them a read, these are awesome, awesome content. And our PMP blog post is a place for you to like a safe space for you to post any kind of information related to Microsoft 365 if you want to share it with the community because every voice matters and it's really easy to go about it. And if you go about it, you can get a badge for your contributions. So be sure to give it a check, give it a read, folks. Give us some feedback, and see you next two weeks. In two weeks, yeah, something like that. Okay, back to you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Copilot prompts. So, uh, we've got a sample folder in the repository for sharing prompts. So, if you're using Microsoft Copilot and you've got a prompt you'd like to share, we would love to have it. In fact, we we look through those. And we try and highlight some of those. So, this week we wanted to highlight uh, RC. Uh, she's got a prompt here for the ASP.NET Core MVC where she wants to do an Azure DevOps pipeline. It has it build that whole thing for her. So that's pretty awesome. So check that out. So if you are in that kind of area or maybe it'll inspire you that, you know, with your build pipeline um, that you could put some stuff together there. Maybe some of those gulp tasks, right? There you go, Vanessa. See, look at that. I brought it all back. Wow. All right. So let's go to the next one. And uh, let's see. Are we? Uh, Bo. I am here. All right, Bo. I do am it. here. All right, uh, so we had planned to release 4.7 on Monday, but uh, we've had some delays here. So we're hoping to get that processed uh, this afternoon. There were a couple breaking issues that we had to fix. Um, so it includes some documentation uh, and our package version updates. Um, the biggest feature is Daniel Toft has uh, made a significant uh, improvement to how we do filters for our um, REST calls. So we now have Lambda style filters filters uh, that will get deployed. It's been on nightly for the last uh, couple of weeks, but we would love feedback on that. It's in a beta state. So if there's any issues, just please let it, let us know. Um, and then there was an update to the presets for graph to include any missing um, modules. Um, as always, version three support uh, is has ended. If you're using three, please upgrade to four. And as always, check out our updates via the nightly build uh, at P and P slash SP at v4 nightly after say back to you nice Ooh. and gary you got some updates for us on the uh, cli i don't think gary made it in today so feel free no! to take it away Gary, why? okay all right i'll try it here hey uh 
there were 31 breaking John Nefflin. I'm just reading the slide. Uh, so the DLA for Microsoft 365, that is a cool thing. If you haven't had a chance to use that yet, please check it out. I'm not going to read the slide to you. Um, if you haven't had a chance to work with it, though, it is really, really awesome. It helps you manage your 365 tenant or SharePoint framework projects uh, across any platform, right? So whether you're Windows, Mac OS, Linux, whatever, um, you can use it like PowerShell, Commander, Bash, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you can configure in Microsoft 365, you can manage your SharePoint framework projects, and you can build automation scripts. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, um, if you're doing some of the stuff with those build pipelines stuff, this is the tool for you. All right. And speaking of other cool tools, uh, Dev Proxy. So if you are building anything off a of graph or anything else with these kind of APIs and you want to be able to test that stuff, right? I know graph always works perfectly at all times in production. Uh, but just for, you know, kicks, you might want to pretend it doesn't work sometimes. And that's what this enables you to do. So this is a great way to make sure that all of your stuff is going to react the way you expect it to before you get those tickets assigned to you. Okay. And let's go on over here. Alex, are you around for the, uh, the SPFX controls? I am around. All right. Yes. Woo. Yep. Uh, so nothing new right now. We are still on 3.19 for React controls and 3.18 for uh, property controls. We are planning for the next release in the next couple of uh, weeks. We have... A lot of stuff already uh, merged, so it should be a great release. And uh, hopefully, we'll also have support for SPFX 120 during this release. And uh, as always, uh, feel free to contribute, uh, submit issues. And yeah, these releases are because of you. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Wowee. And Adam, Wowee. I already know you're here. <laughs> so get over here, Adam. Here we go. Do it. <laughs> okay, so we just had a new pre-release of SharePoint Framework Toolkit 4.2.1 and it had just like a small code cleanup, but it's really good to keep your code base nice and tidy and was done by one of our regular contributors, Sarabach Tripathi. So thanks a lot again, man. You really, really rock. And currently we are progressing towards our next minor version in which we want to update our upgrade and validate actions. So now if you cl will click on the upgrade and validate, currently it will give you a report what you have to change to upgrade to the latest version of SPFX. It, but now after this will be get merged, you will get a code tour that will guide you and show you guidance directly in code which line of code you need to change. And we are we added a new manage chat command. So SPFX toolkit is also present in the as a chat as a chat participant in the GitHub chat in, uh, in Visual Studio Code. And there we added a new manage command. So if you are logged in to your tenant in SPFX toolkit, you can use this command to actually ask questions about your tenant. So it can retrieve, for example, what size do I have or what list do I have on my uh, on my specified site or what items do I have on, on this list and so on and so forth or app or catalogs. And you can currently it only supports list and get kind of commands. So what you see in and this uh, short uh, animation here, and it's using under beneath, of course, CLI for Microsoft 365, so which I use both here, and it can reason over this data and explain it to you or show the raw data. In the future, we are considering to give you the power to add, so create, modify, and remove, but I want your feedback here. Is it useful? Is it uh, stupid? Or is it smart? So I'm really interested about your feedback here. Give this for sure a try and let me know and let this tool just make your SPFX development skyrock high, okay? <laughs> Wowee, back to you, Chris. <laughs> Wowee. All right, Casper. Yeah, yeah. We've just released <laughs> a newer version of uh, the PMP Martin Search and uh, we had uh, adaptive cards back online again and we had some uh, minor updates to the um, to how uh, external items works, the, those uh, data that you pull from uh, PMP, uh, sorry, for, from the graph uh, connectors. So, uh, and we had some new uh, contributors as well, and that's really great. And um, we have the usual crowd as well joining up. So uh, take that one for a spin. And uh, the feature of this week is that uh, if you don't know it, you can actually connect two results web parts and make sort of like a master details view. Where if you select one item, then you see at, um, connected items to that one. So if you have like a case management system, you select that one, then you can see, for instance, the metadata related to that case, or you can see the files or whatever you have uh, related to that one. It's a pretty neat uh, feature, so take a look at it. And we have both samples for it and, of course, extended documentation. So uh, back to you, Chris. Yeehaw! No. I have I have a quick one. So, oh. if there's any SPFX or Webpack ninjas on the call, uh, uh, we need help to upgrade 
above uh, Shepman Framework version 118.2 because it just doesn't work if we upgrade to 119 or 120. So if someone wants to give that a go and upgrade uh, and upgrade it, feel free. Ooh, was that the ubiquitous Mikhail? Right. That will say you because it's Mikel. And I tried to have some energy. See, I even have bubbles in my camera. <laughs> Perfect. And now David, the ubiquitous yes. David. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, we got tons of SPFX samples, speaking of which, we just did a whole refresh initiative on those. Uh, but there are new samples to be created. So we'd love you to contribute those. Uh, Hugo is working through all those repos and PRs that have been already submitted. So we thank you. We will be thanking you individually in a future call. Same goes with the ACES. If we move to the next slide, you can get in on that as well. Love new samples. So please don't hesitate to submit. Uh, we'd love to get those in. Derek and Anoop are doing a great job. And you can get a badge for all of that as well so take advantage of that and as we always do it is picture time so get those cameras turned on and we'll see those fantastic faces chris i have camtasia all set up and ready to go so let me do this and it looks like all right we already got some pretty faces all ready to go all right, it's a little grainy today, but that's okay. It's like the community protection program. Feel free to turn them on if you want. We got a minute or two, which is a little over time, so we'll try to be quick here. Expanding the rows, it all looks good. I see Luisa and Mikhail are high-fiving up there. Ijaz uh, looks like he's selling furniture on the side. He's like one of those uh, wavy guys on the side of the road, right? there, <laughs> With the wind and the air, awesome, I love it. Okay. One more second, everybody, just to get those cameras turned on, and let's start recording. Three, two, one. Wave to the community. All right. Looking great. Love to see everybody. Love the excitement, the smiles. You all look fantastic. Thank you for all the amazing, amazing contributions you make. Love to see it. All right. Chris, take it back over. Ooh. All right. Let me uh, hit that share button again, I guess. I guess. Oh, Wowee. All right. Wowee. All right. Now it's time for those demos. So, Luis, you are up first with the uh, SVGs and list, and uh, take it whenever you want. It's all yours. Okay, so I will quickly show my screen. Hi, I'm Lisa. I uh, specify, specialize in uh, Power Apps uh, and uh, Power uh, Point, as we can clearly see. So I call myself an architect. Most important thing about me is I'm a colorful person. Um, very important shade of pink for me is FF69. Before that is hot pink. That is the color that you will see a lot today. My session today is about how to create a web part that populates uh, SharePoint lists with um, SVGs. And you will need to know that this dyno uh, here on the screen uh, plays a very important role in that demo. So keep a lookout for it. Okay, so what are SVGs? So SVGs are scalable vector graphics. It's basically just XML code, and we can define vector-based graphics with that. They are super small in size, but we, if we want to scale them, we can easily do that without any quality loss, like you experience that with uh, PNGs or JPEGs, and they work in all browsers. So what I wanted to achieve is I wanted to take an SVG, and put that into kind of a funnel. And then I wanted to output a JSON code snippet that would be accepted by a SharePoint lists column as a format. Usually there's a super tedious manual process to do that. And that involves, you need to download an SVG, you open that in add, you open the dev tools, you select the first line, you right click then add it as HTML, you will select everything, uh, you save that somewhere, and then you would need to extract all of these colors over here and all of the um, path values. And then you would need to wrap that into the correct JSON format. And I am super lazy, so I did not want to do this over and over and over again because that is just like super tedious and I'm too lazy for that. So the correct JSON format that we would need, I put a screenshot in here, that will be we define a div and inside of that div, we have an SVG with a view box. So that defines where we are looking at and how big we are. And then we have a um, path element in the children and we put the um, D, so the path of that stroke that we just uh, looked at of that SVG and the fill color in the styles. And we do this over and over and over again, so long that we just like have all of these strokes that comprise the SVG. But watch out, they can really be lengthy and they can really be a lot, just like depending on how complex your SVG is. So I felt there needed to be a better way. 
And just for my purposes, because I wanted to do something in the list, I built a super simple Node.js app. So, and that was just vanilla JavaScript, but it worked, but it only worked on my machine. And we're not shipping my machine. So I thought like, it's maybe a good idea to have everyone benefit from that. So I put that on the website um, and everyone could now um, just input their SVG files and get the JSON code for their, um, for their SharePoint list. Then I thought this needs to be a web part. And I will quickly show you how I, um, how I did this. So I will in here. Oh, we love the sharing, I guess. That's what it is. Okay. So what I do here, obviously, I prepared this Dino SVG for us. This is the website. And if I just like drag and drop this over here, it will display me this XML code, which I desperately need. But you can see there are just like a lot of numbers. So this is just like the fill colors. And all of that is here, all of these D paths. And they can really, really, really be long. So the only button that I have will just like not do the magic over here. And if I open up this file, you can see that. That is exactly the structure that I told you about. So we have the view box, and then we have all of these D paths here, and then we have the um, fill in the um, style object, and we do this over and over and over again, and that makes the format for the SharePoint list color. Mm -hmm. So quickly back to our demo. I thought, why not put that as a web part directly in SharePoint? And my second question was, how hard can it be? And obviously, these are very famous last words. And as a disclaimer, this is my very, very first web part. So I never built a web part before. So um, please be kind when I um, demo this now. What you need to know is for a web part, I do not want employees to just like have any SVG, but I wanted to provide a library with approved SVGs. For the sake of it, obviously, I will show them to you. So we have this little dino, but we have others as well. But it could be logos, it could be anything, but I needed to motivate myself to deal with that. So um, these are rather uh, nice um, SVGs right now. So what we would do, is um let me republish this very good we can now select an svg file over here and these obviously are the same ones and i will select the dino here again so i get the little preview and i can now convert that and copy that to my clipper because it does not make any sense to download this for now because i only need this to be copied to my clipboard if i wanted to take that for further code manipulation for example in my code editor but what I can also do is I can now select a site, a list, and a column and apply that format directly to a column of my choosing. So right here, I have a list on my site tech. It's called process. I have a title over here. It is the 42, and I want to format uh, this column demo over here. So what I will do is I will select that. that. So I have the tech, I have process, and I'll select demo. And say apply column formatting and would open up obviously the um the new tab here so that I can exactly validate what I did before. So let's have a look um how this is built. I created obviously the web part itself and then I added functionality and I quickly realized well this is going to be super lengthy so I quickly learned how to divide up my uh, web parts into a parent component, which would rather be the orchestrator, and then into several uh, child components, which, will, which would then just like take care of, um, of the different uh, features that I wanted to add. And I also learned how um, 
dealing with our React hooks would work so that I could just like clean my code a little bit and also reuse the things that I already did. Uh, we have the SVG input. This is uh, fetching the uh, files from the library, which is done uh, with the uh, React hook. The um, SVG output, which is our preview. The convert button that takes care of converting and copying. The site selector, list selector, and column selector which are all the drop-down menus, which also use our React hooks, and also then the final apply button, which will finally apply the JSON uh, format to the um, selected column of the list on the site uh, that the user wanted that to be. What I tried to do is use PMPJS because at first I did not, and then I realized how hard I was making that for myself, and with it, it was way easier. Second thing is using hooks whenever possible, because I like it if the logic is just like outside of what I uh, wanted to do so that this was just like way more reusable for me. And then no hard, hard coded values anywhere so that I could apply this for a multi-language as well, because at least my customers, I'm from Germany, we don't speak English. So that would just like make uh, things uh, more easy. And then I really wanted to have good documentation just like to do a service for our community and future me. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of a code tour. Let's go like this over here. Here we go. So obviously we would start in the README file because it just like gives us all the information that we need, including the uh, lovely mermaid di diagram that you just like saw right now. Um, the next thing is um, I made a property pane so that the user would uh, be able to de define a site URL and a library name. And that obviously needs some improvement so that we have just like more than basic data validation in here, but that I, oh, sorry but that I, I could reuse uh, the hooks um, that I already talked about for the site and the um, uh, the list. Next thing, come on. Next thing would be, um, we, um, we did the um, parent component that would then just like orchestrate, just like all the other um, UI elements that uh, we can see here. Next part is the SVG input. That uh, is the uh, drop-down menu for the um, SVG files that uses um, a hook that is called use SVG files hook. That is what we do in here. So we just uh, fetch all the files um, from the library name and the site URL that we defined in the property pane. The next thing is our convert button. So that is just like the heart of it. Um, so we need to extract all the D and all the fill attributes from the SVG code and wrap that into the format that the SharePoint list would expect. And we do this right over here. And obviously we also set a size and get just like um, a fallback color if we um, sometimes in SVGs, the fill color is not present. So we needed to have a fallback color for that as well. The next part that we need to cover would be the site selector. The site selector calls a hook that um, will query all the available site collections. And I do this um, right over here. And then we need to have uh, the list selector. The list selector will display only the lists that are first um, available on that site collection. So there's already that. And then we just like exclude um, some of the uh, lists because um, those are the, the built-in lists that we do not want to open for uh, custom formatting. At least I didn't want to do this, so I excluded those. And um, finally, in the column selector, I again use a hook. It's the use fetch fields um, hook um, to get all the columns that are in the um, in the list that we uh, selected previously. And last but not least, we finally apply the format that we created in the list, in the column, in the list, on the site. And then obviously we um, open uh, that list so that we uh, can validate uh, the format immediately. OK, back to the uh, slides. Here. 
So we did the code tour. So now I have a question for you. Uh, please help a newbie out because I need a lot of good advice for better code and better docs and all the tips and tricks that community might have for me because I want to improve because that was my very first one. And although I'm pretty proud that I made a web part, I know that I can still learn a lot of that. And uh, I feel sharing is caring applies here as well. And with that, thanks. <laughs> All right, awesome. Really, really cool, Luis. Uh, love it. Um, very impressive. Uh, could you pick something harder for your first web part? <laughs> right? They're very cool, though. Touched on all sorts of areas. Um, and I think that's going to be really helpful uh, for a lot of end users that are especially trying to do uh, some of that list formatting with SVGs because that can get pretty complicated sometimes, right? Uh, as we know. So that's awesome. And uh, let's go ahead and just for time move into Jazz. So if you're ready, Jazz, you can go ahead and take over. Mm, thanks, guys. Um, let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? You got it? Right. Yep, yep, right. looks good. Right. Thank you. Hi, hi, guys. My name is Ejaz. I'm a developer architect in Advania UK. Um, uh, here's my LinkedIn and um, Twitter handle or X handle. Please get in touch, um, you know, for if you have any question or uh, queries regarding Microsoft 365 and uh, and and Azure or Copilot, I'd um, uh, love to talk about and share uh, insights. So today I'm presenting a, um, a topic uh, on, on automating employees onboarding. Um, no, so the today uh, we looked in in terms of the presentation. We have we're going to look. We're going to talk about what I'm. Uh, what's the automating uh, onboarding uh, employees uh, application look like and what it does? Then demo. We're going to quickly look into the code and then if there's any questions at the end. So um, the main purpose of this um, was. Uh, uh, I wanted to some scenario. I recently I worked on a client app where. Um, I have to use the Microsoft Graph SDK batching, and that previously I used to. If you guys have, you know, uh, used the, I, I used previously few, uh, quite a few times uh, Microsoft Graph API batching, not the SDK one. And there was always a limitation: that you can only process 20 requests at a time, and then you have to manage that limitation in your code by yourself. So recently, the, um, I came across. Uh, uh, the article in on Microsoft documents where now the SDK, the latest version of SDK, Microsoft SDK, support batching, and uh, uh, so I end up using that uh, Microsoft SDK batching. And what happened was I was dealing a, nearly 2,000, 3,000 uh, uh, records, and and the good job for uh, the good, good good point for this SDK batching was is I don't have to do any uh, handling any uh, limitation handling in my code. Everything is had uh, happening behind the scene automatically. So that's a mass, big big plus. So I can only concentrate on my business logic than handling the limitation myself. So uh, so and then end up building uh, this um, uh, automating employee onboarding uh, app app. So to demonstrate that. So basically, what we're going to do today is to um, uh, we use the SPFX app um, where we can import um, some uh, employees from CSV or could be from SharePoint list. And then what we want to do sometimes they we need to do so many tasks when we uh, onboard the employees might be uh, uh, updating their um, group uh, departments, update, uh, uh, putting them into a, some sorts of teams, giving them certain permission or something. So there are always, you know, tasks to do for each individual employee when we all bird them. So we'll look into that, how we can automate them and uh, and use the Microsoft Graph SDK batching uh, to do that. So uh, key features in this one uh, is we're going to import the bulk user uh, with via CSV, use the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Graph SDK batching, and then uh, we'll also logged into the SharePoint list as well for the auditing purposes, so we can go back and check for each user uh, what task has been completed or what hasn't been completed, kind of thing. So uh, for the architecture for this uh, app is we're going to first of all um, uh, import the user uh, from CSV, then uh, on uh, with the onboarding web part, we'll take that. Import from CSV and then pass this to Azure Function. Azure Function then um, go and use the Microsoft Graph SDK batching 
uh, and he does these three things, updating the user department, joining the Microsoft Teams, email and send the email notification to each individual user. Once it's done the processing and the Azure function then send a notification uh, back that is done. And at the same time, when he's done all these three tasks, uh, is law is also logging into SharePoint list as well for individual users. So they, you know, they, who, whoever is running the uh, is this app, they can go back and check uh, the status, like you know, for each individual user what has been completed. So, um, so let's let's jump on a demo uh, quickly. Uh, so, so that's um, onboarding uh, web part uh, where. Um, uh, we have to, I'm going to just uh, select the CSV file. So CSV file has um, an onboarding CSV file. It has a three user just for the um, uh, simplicity. Uh, so that it doesn't take too much time in the demo to process these. So what we need is basically we need the email address. Here are the email address. Here is a you know, department I wanted to add them into it. So things we're going to do, user, updating the user department, joining the Microsoft Teams, uh, email notification. So if I hit proceed and uh, if I show you on this side uh, that's like your functions locally running which is basically processing each user now so that's processing then the next user um, so while it's processing so one of them is already processed so if I can show you uh, the final emails um, so if I go in here while it's processing all of them right so you already completed the presence you could see here uh, and then I can go back to, so it's completed the department team membership notification. And if I'll go to the shipment list and it's also logged um, for each individual user is processed. Uh, it's done the department teams notification and process on completed on. So you can basically have some analysis and some source of your logging that you can confirm that has been completed on what date. Uh, if we show you the email quickly uh, for each individual user, um, you, you can they will probably getting some email as well saying okay this is what you've been uh, the teams you have joined this is your updated department kind of thing so yeah you can send that uh, email via the max grab sdk as well so jumping on a code um so right so so first of all uh from the share uh, spfx point of view If I simply go into the container and then go to um, induction web component. So this is the main components where everything is happening. So uh, so if I have just shown you what's going on. So first of all, uh, we have this. Uh, I'm using a com library called uh, Mentine Core uh, where I'm using the stepper. So stepper component is here. Um, so what happening is I'm dropping and it's used behind the scene. It's used the dra drop zone component to drop the files. So uh, so when I click uh, drop the file, so I have this pass CSV file method, which basically extracting uh, data from the CSV name, email department, uh, and then putting into the object. So in the table, so I can see and the user can see. And when they hit uh, on click on the onboarding, start the onboarding. I'm calling Azure function, uh, which is running locally at the moment. It could be, um, you know, running on the Azure as well. So, uh, and the Azure function is doing all the job behind the scene. And once it's done, and then it's sending the request back here, yeah, everything has been completed. So, going back to the Azure function, um, just so what's that code look like? So, um, so if I just close all of them, close tab. Uh, so in the program file, so one thing which I uh, initialize uh, dependency injection for uh, share, um, a PNP core library for because I'm logging into SharePoint uh, list. I could have used Microsoft Graph, but I, uh, uh, I had this uh, plugged in initially. Then I uh, using uh, plugged in the Microsoft Graph. So yes, I have, I'm using the PNP core uh, for uh, SharePoint logging. Then I have a Microsoft Graph uh, service as well. So if I quickly go to Microsoft Graph service, where the actual magic is happening uh, on this method, user onboarding. So the request details will be a list of all the user coming from uh, on this onboarding function, where I'm just calling this 
graph service as user onboarding request detail. So if I go back, so first of all, I get the client uh, graph client, and uh, that's it's the base using the Azure Identity uh, um, library. So this is the separate helper uh, function. So once I got the graph client, I'm using the app. Um, app only um, permissions to get the graph client because the user's delegate permission is not needed in this case. So no, I'm, this is where I'm processing each user. So um, so when, so we have a three task here. One, we have to update the user department, assign the user to department team, send email to users. So what's going to happen? What's so happening here? So if I expand this one, I'm just making a request here. So as you can see here. Uh, do patch request information, and this is the my payload. So this is the request. So it hasn't completed, it hasn't this, I just initialized the request. I just created a request, didn't do anything else. Uh, and then the same goes with the user, uh, assigning user to, um, uh, and that's the assigning user. Um, and then I said, uh, assigning user to department team. So I said graph client, and this is the request to post permissions. This is a team membership request, and then send send email request. That's a default template, and at the end is a send email request. So I have three requests are ready. So I haven't actually made a request. It's just I've I've prepared the request, and now I, I created a batch request collection content collection object, uh, and this this gives you batch request content. So I need to add my all these requests uh, into that content. So you could see here, here I'm adding all my three requests for each user into that content. And this approach is not using the depend on, there's no ordering, but you can also handle this a different approach where you can, if you wanna have like some dependency, handling the dependency, you can also do that as well. We'll see, we'll look at it in, in a minute as well. So this is, uh, because I don't need to, uh, I don't really care at this point whether which, um, which requests get completed first. So uh, I just wanted to add that into the request collection. And once that's done, and this is why I'm executing the batch. So this batch is ha uh, this is where I'm executing. So now once it's executed, now if this point, uh, uh, so this is where I'm getting the uh, for and for each step, you can get the response separately. So for example, you can see a get response by ID. So that was the ID I. Uh, uh, you know, this is where I, I wanted a response for this one. So basically for each re uh, request separately, you can get the response and then do whatever you need to do. Uh, so I'm getting that. And then also I'm logging at the end, I'm logging into the SharePoint as well. The same information was has been all the tasks been completed in the Microsoft Graph. So, and that is where the magic is happening. And if uh, I have a more than 20, as we know is a limitation, then, um, the Microsoft Graph SDK handling automatically behind the scene. Uh, so you don't have to worry about if you're sending uh, in here, uh, your users, they are more than 20 in a list. So if let's suppose you pass 50, it will automatically convert into the uh, 20, 20 batches behind the scene. So that's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, from that side. If, uh, and the other code is just usual and already submitted uh, in, in the, uh, sample wrappers. So yeah, that's all from me if you have any question. Oh, and there is a one, sorry, I would just before I wrap over, I wanna go back to the presentation so I can show you the uh, some useful links. So here's the useful links for batching and the PNP Core SDK, which I use. And if I go and share uh, this, this is the link where you please go and have a look. Uh, so you, this is where you create the batch, simple batching, which I used in the C-Shop. Uh, and there is a one batch with a dependent request as well. Uh, so this is a way you can implement like this. So yeah, that's all for me guys, if you have any question. Awesome, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and jump over to Martin. So Martin, if you're ready to show us some customer retention controls, we'd love it. Yes, absolutely. Let me share my screen. Thank you. So can you all see my screen? That's the most important question. Yes, you. If you can. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Okay, so um, yeah, so to understand what's going on here, so let me first introduce myself. I'm Martin Lingstyle. Very hard to pronounce name, but it's a very important name to me. Um, I'm a Microsoft 365 architect in the Netherlands and also an MVP in the development category. And I was recently uh, reading this blog post of a colleague, uh, not a colleague, direct colleague, but a colleague MVP, Joanne Klein, about retention and how auto-applying labels 
uh, have certain consequences uh, when using uh, retention controls in SharePoint. So um, I was thinking about how how if if, if I could make a uh, a control that could make that uh, easier, that could make the life of a uh, record manager or information professional uh, easier in terms of cleaning labels, clearing labels from a lot of items, toggling records to be uh, locked or unlocked, things like that. And to know what we're talking about here, and maybe it's a it's handy to 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 uh, rewind a bit, to go back a bit, and to see what's what actually are we talking about? What 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 are labels, for example? Let's let's go back and take so um, labels. In my eyes, uh, are like uh, pieces of metadata that are used to classify content with the intention of enforcing certain behavior. So a lot of people know, uh, for example, uh, uh, sensitivity labels, uh, but retention labels are also very important. And both are actually part of the Microsoft Purview offering that Microsoft has. And Microsoft Purview is the the big tool that is used to to apply this behavior, this security and compliance behavior across uh, uh, the scope of your entire Microsoft 365 tenant. So you can use them, uh, sensitivity labels, you can use retention labels to apply to files in SharePoint, files in OneDrive, transactions in Copilot, chats in Teams, emails in Exchange, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Microsoft Purview does it all and applies that this be behavior across the board. So this is really a uh, powerful and very interesting uh, thing. So. Um, so what what types of labels do we labels do we have? Well, uh, two or three, depending how you look at it. The Purview dashboard kind of leads you to think that there are three types of labels. There's sensitivity labels, of course, uh, and retention labels in two flavors. But I personally say that there's really just two, but with differences in how retention is enforced. So retention labels, uh, which is mainly my focus today, of course, uh, retention labels as a part of the data lifecycle management. Uh, concept is more about classifying labels to make it clear how the end of the document lifecycle will look for label data. So in short, it's about simply like uh, automatically deleting data after X years uh, or marking documents to make sure it's clear that you want to keep them around. Um, so it's about data lifecycle management, about where does the data go uh, after X years. Uh, but it's not really, there's not really a behavior enforced when a document is uh, labeled. So during the retention term, you can still edit, update, or uh, delete a document, uh, for example. So retention labels as part of record management, that's just basically the same labels, but now they come with extra controls to be able to force behavior during the retention period. So we declare content as a record, meaning that that content should and uh, cannot be deleted during X years. And after these years have passed, we can have it automatically deleted, or maybe uh, we want to have a disposition review uh, for using of a, a certain record managers or archival per people will look at the data if it can be really deleted. And they can say yes, delete it, and then the content is deleted. So this is basically the two big, um, the two big types of labels that we have. So retention labels and sensitivity, and um, a lot of it is really um, uh, quite similar. So if you look at the purview menu, for example, you see that all these labels actually have things like policies with which you can publish uh, these labels. They all have classifiers, which means that there's some automation for auto-labeling content based on the content of the content. I love that wordplay there. And there's data explorers and content explorers making it easy to see what data has been labeled. Um, so there's differences as well, but there's uh, there's also a, a real a lot of similarities in, in, in how these things work behind the scenes. Of course, they do very different things, right? So information protection labels, so sensitivity labels do really different things from retention labels, but the way in which they uh, are applied or in, uh, and how it looks in purview is really a lot of, a lot of, a lot similar. So um, let me see. Uh, so about applying these labels, well, there's, uh, how can you do that? Well, there's a couple of ways to do that, of course. Uh, you can do it manually, of course. Uh, and Microsoft has delivered these uh, couple of drop downs. For example, this is one in SharePoint. So if you've got a, uh, you've, if you've selected a document, you can select a sensitivity label or a retention label to apply to the content. Um, and you can, for 
retention labels you can you can uh, you can really publish labels to the to sites so for example you can make sure that for a set of hr sites uh, specific labels can be selected for example labels that matter to uh, people in hr who work with personnel information while you publish a different set of labels to sites around financial uh, situations you know uh, uh, retention labels that would be relevant there uh, and this is, of course, a very, very easy way. It's, it's basically still a, a piece of metadata that you can select. Um, but labeling manu manually is, of course, also a bore. Like people generally don't know what retention terms should be applied to the content they, they've created. They, they mostly don't know, at least in, in, in my environment, they don't. So they would need to contact the uh, archival people, and, you know, people in their company who work with archives to know uh, how long this data should be uh, retained and what, what 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 the rules are around uh, keeping keeping files and archiving files so ma labeling manually is difficult difficult and this is why microsoft has also uh, um, delivered some uh, automatic labeling policy so uh, this means for attention labels this means that you can create uh, a label that automatically applies to content based on certain pieces of metadata which is awesome, uh, uh, and of course you can also build your own automation. So if you if you don't if you're not uh, auto apply labels by Microsoft, will also have some drawbacks. And if those drawbacks uh, matter for you, you can also build some custom automation and apply labels in your own way. Uh, the problem with automatic labeling, though, is if you and this is the reason. Now I'm coming back to why I built this web part. Uh, uh, if you apply labels automatically. They won't be, you won't be able to select them as a user, which means that you also, as a, a site owner, for example, or a archiving professional, you won't be able to clear labels as well or switch them. So as soon as this automatic pro process has run, you won't be able to do anything about the uh, retention label because, well, as you can see, the dropdown is not available because the retention labels have not been published to these sites in, in a way uh, for manual labeling. They have just been uh, auto-applied to the content. So how to go about it? How, to, uh, how, how can you make it possible for people to clear labels or to work with records in this way? For example, um, a lot of these files that you can see in the screenshot are record type, are labeled with a record type label, meaning they are locked. And record type labels, can also be unlocked. So if you want to work with it or make a new version of the record and you want to add some specific important information, you can unlock the record, change the file and relock it. But also uh, those, those features are also not available now because, well, the dropdown isn't available because the label has been applied automatically. So we need something, we need a way to make this easier. And this is where I uh, created an SPFX extension to, uh, to do that. An SPF extension that makes it easy to view retention settings. So what's actually going on in this library? What labels have, or what files have been labeled? What are the settings for those labels? And also to be able to um, do some bulk actions like clearing labels or uh, locking or unlocking. So I would like to show you uh, in the demo. Let me see. Okay, so uh, this is my SharePoint environment. As you can see, I have a library, and in this library, I have a lot of files. And all these files have been labeled. So a couple have been labeled with a record retention label. So this is uh, uh, one of the two types of retention labels that I named earlier. And some of these have been labeled with a regular data lifecycle management label. Those are these ones with a very descriptive name, of course, as you can see. Um, this one is slightly more descriptive. Uh, apparently, these uh, files labeled with this retention label will be retained for 10 years. And this will just, I don't even know what I configured in terms of retention term. Um, but the, the, the point is that they're different. As you can see, um, SharePoint has added a lock, a slight lock here. You can see it uh, here, which means that this document is locked. It's locked with a record type label. So uh, how does my extension work? Well, it's a list view command set extension, which you can trigger by 
clicking a button. So, and this is, as you can see, I haven't selected a document right now. I can select the document and execute it on this one file. So now I would be able to view the retention settings for this one file. I can also select a set of files, or I can just not select anything at all and just open it. And if I click the button, the, uh, a dialog will open, which will uh, show, which will load actually all the files in this library that have a retention label. And it will show all the settings that are relevant for retention. So uh, it shows the label, uh, who it was applied and when it was applied. If it was an event-based label, which is a specific type of advanced uh, label, it will show the event date. Uh, this is very interesting for situations in which you want to uh, retain documents from a specific date. For example, uh, all personnel information from the date that he was fired, things like that. Um, you see the behavior that is that is relevant for this uh, for this file, and uh, and you see a couple of settings here. So as you can see, uh, we had a couple of documents that were labeled with a record retention label. Um, and the behavior for that label is retain as record. And we have a couple of um, files that are labeled with a, well, the data lifecycle management label for which the behavior is do not retain. So this means that um, uh, this file can be deleted. That's what it means. So it's, it, 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 it will not be retained. If I try to delete this file, it, it, it won't work. It will give me a, an error. But if I try to delete this file, you can. So that, that's what this means, the behavior. And you can also see in the, in the table here that there's um, these, there are these specific um, check marks about what you can do with this file. This is basically just uh, applied retention information. What, so what, what can you do with a record? You cannot delete it. No, you cannot. Uh, you can update the metadata of this file. And this is actually a setting in purview. I can also disable it, which would mean that uh, a nice red cross would start showing here. It's a tenant wide setting which we, with which you can say, well, if a record is applied, a record label is applied, you can still, or you can't, change metadata. Um, there's a, a a column about content updates. No, content updates are not allowed. And uh, label changes are allowed. This is really interesting, right? So as a, if I've got enough permissions, I will be able to change the label to a different kind of label. And then there's um, uh, another icon that says, is this record locked? Well, yes, it's locked, as you can see. But you can also click this link and unlock it. So now you can see the, the icons will shift. As you can see, the label update is now not allowed because the unlocked record cannot be changed. You need to re-lock it first. But the content update check mark is, is now uh, changed, has now been changed to a uh, to a uh, check mark. Like you can now update the content of this file. And this is just, I mean, the, I didn't really think the uh, I, I didn't really build this in like hard code of this. This is just information coming from the Microsoft Graph that tells me what can be done with this file in this current setup. I can also relock it, of course, and I can, if I want, clear the label. Now the label is gone on this file. So as you can see, this is the use case for this, um, for this uh, control. It's like, okay, I am a archival manager or a person working as a record manager in a company, and I want to be able to influence specific uh, documents in my SharePoint environment. I can, cannot do so using the regular SharePoint controls because, well, we apply labels automatically and my controls are gone. Now, this tool will help you to see specific information on these files and change them if you like. Um, I can also, well, navigate back and forth, things like that, but I can also do some bulk actions. Now, I see my screen is a little bit too too small here, but I can, for example, take a bulk action and lock all records in this document library. And this can, for, well, it will show you a dialog because it might take a while if you've got a big library. Um, but still, you can click yes and it will start locking all the files in your library. Well, in my case, they were all locked. These, these are records, they are all locked. I can, of course, unlock them. And it will now go and unlock all these files, all these records in my library and uh, give me back the result. This may take a little bit of a while. 
Uh, just like the previous speaker, by the way, I impl implemented batching in here. I will show, if I have time, I will show you in a minute. As you can see, all my records are now unlocked and all the information has been changed and I can now work with these con this content and change it if I like. I can also bulk clear all labels if I like. So these are really um, uh, things that are, that, that uh, you can you can see how, how how you can use this to to uh, to work with labels across a library uh, and do things like for an entire library, for example. Maybe you've got a library with a lot of files hidden all in, in subfolders, and people have unlocked certain records to uh, to work with it. And now you want to relock everything in one go. Well, you can use the bulk action method here and lock everything in one go, uh, which would be quite powerful. Uh, okay, so how much time do I have left? I don't think I have time left. Is it correct, uh, David? Uh, uh, yeah, I think we're about ready to wrap up, but yeah. Chris will handle so, that for us. Okay, so I'll wrap it up. So I don't really have time to show you a lot, uh, a lot of the code. So um, I think I'll just skip that then. Um, I do have a couple of, uh, of resources here and you can download, always you can download my latest release on my own GitHub page. Uh, there's a lot of information in there. Um, I will try to keep it uh, updated. I, I, I've got a lot of ideas about how to make this uh, even better. So, for example, how to uh, have some extra security controls to make sure that only certain people can can use this control. Uh, for example, only people in a certain Entra ID group. Uh, I've got a lot of ideas and I'm working with a lot of people who work with retention uh, to get this even better. So if you if you work if you started working with retention or you're interested in it, do contact me. I do also have a lot of blogs on my personal blog about retention. Um, do read up on that and let me know if you've got questions. I like the subject and um, I like to work with it. So back to you guys. Wow, thanks, Martin. That was awesome. Three awesome demos today. Lots of really, really good information. Thank you so much to everyone that uh, was able to stick around uh, to make sure we caught all that, because I think it was well worth well worth it. Uh, and if you would like to provide us some feedback about the calls, right, so specifically around the structure, the types of demos we have, kinds of things you'd like to see, suggestions you have, please fill this out. We would love to hear from you. And then finally, uh, if you haven't uh, checked out our Discord server yet, please do. There's 2,300 plus people on there. Uh, where you can ask questions, you can talk. Uh, it could be kind of like Stack Overflow, but a lot nicer. So come on in, it'll be fun. Uh, we'll be happy to talk with you there. And then that's it. So this will be pushed on uh, YouTube within about 24 hours. So be sure to check out the recording there. Thanks so much for joining. And uh, wowee! 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.